Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan Energy Man. Stan Osterman here. Not with a whole lot of energy today. It's been a heck of a week. It's been a heck of a year. Can you believe it is already November? I mean, I was walking over here to the studio and they're putting out Christmas decorations already and I'm blown away. But um, today's show is really uh, kind of interesting. I had a busy, busy week this week. And we're going to start off uh, talking about some of the events that happened earlier in the week. And my, my guest for this week actually crumped out on me at last minute. So I was looking at some of the homeless folks down, downstairs and grabbed one of them and brought him up. So I have a curious observer here with me, and uh, he's going he's gonna to start off the show. So uh, this curious observer may look familiar to some of you. Uh, Jay Fidel, who's, uh, of course, the, the big heavy hitter here at ThinkTech. And uh, thanks, Jay, for being on the show with me. Thank you, Stan. I appreciate it. So uh, earlier this week, um, there was an interesting event at the University of Hawaii East West Center, Jefferson Hall. And uh, it was a... a Compilation of six companies from Germany organized by the local um, com um, a, a Consul General uh, from Germany and the German Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it was their second annual German Hawaii Energy Symposium. And uh, it was a really great event. Um, well done, especially considering how quickly they had to get all the moving pieces together. And in spite of all the rain that came down that day, Tuesday we had some like two inches of rain, an hour kind of rain. Um, and they pulled it off, and it, it was really great. They had uh, great speakers, um, great panels, and uh, it was a great event. So Jay was there for some of it, and what we wanted to do is kind of share a little bit about that day. So thanks, Jay, for, for being here. And um, that, that symposium, I was really impressed with the companies that they brought over. Some of them were energy companies. Some of them were sustainability architecture-type companies. Um, some of the panels talked about sustainable architecture, including panelists from UH School of Architecture mm -hmm. and some local architecture firms that uh, contributed to the whole thing. So it was, it was a really great event. And uh, I know you had a little bit of time. What was your impression uh, of the event as you saw it? Well, I, I was at the one last year, which was more uh, tech than sustainability. Mm -hmm. And I think it's emblematic, the fact that this program has evolved further into sustainability. Uh, I was also, I, I talked to uh, some of the German representatives uh, the other day, and uh, I, I must say that um, I was very impressed with them. They're, they're, they're global thinkers. They know Hawaii very well. They know about our local energy systems, um, and they want to participate. They're not, they're not here to sell. They're here to make partnerships. Right. And I was, I really liked them, as I did last year. I agree. The, um, the companies that came over were looking to be part of Hawaii. They weren't looking to, to just sell stuff. They wanted to be part of the culture here, uh, contribute to the culture here. And I, I think the things that stood out for me were the fact that they all recognized that Hawaii is leaning forward on clean, sustainable energy. And they were really impressed. So bringing them here uh, was easy because that's the goal. And um, I do a lot of work with European hydrogen companies in particular. And some of the concepts they're using on the European continent um, are really directly applicable to Hawaii. On my show a couple of weeks ago, I showed a Norwegian uh, example of how they're taking a coal plant off of an island in Norway, but it's a fairly large population and they're gonna replace it with fuel cells, and they're gonna use liquid hydrogen coming off of North Sea curtailed power and make liquid hydrogen, put it in a, a ship, and we had a photo of the ship that they've already designed to carry liquid hydrogen to this island and supply the hydrogen for the community. And so things like that are, are things that are directly applicable to Hawaii. We're an island, we have a great need for baseload power in Oahu, but we have the, the, the resources on the neighbor islands to produce things like, if we use geothermal for liquid hydrogen, we could easily transport hydrogen to Oahu and use it for baseload power. And that would solve a lot of our clean energy issues. So there were some great companies there. Um, one company was, that was kind of, the, I don't wanna say the odd company, but interesting was a container company that takes used shipping containers. Oh, container work in Maximilian yeah, container uh, sites. That yeah. was awesome. 
And uh, they take these containers, um, they clean them up, they insulate them first, and then they they make really nice, really beautiful, yeah, really nice interiors yeah, in them, yeah. and put windows and doors and stuff in them. Affordable and, housing. Yeah, it's like 320 square feet per container. So two containers, you've got a studio apartment or a one bedroom apartment, and that's a good solution for affordable housing. And you can housing. stack them too. You, you can stack them. You can modularize them together and put them in arrangements around. You know, common areas, and it was just, and the quality of the work in there was really beautiful. So yeah. it got a lot of people's attention. And uh, Maximilian Seitz, who we we had an interview with him later on, which okay. we'll play in our OC16 movie, um, is actually uh, stationed in New York, and they're doing business on the mainland. Mm. So it's very interesting how the Germans are, you know, adding not only their uh, their energy technology. Um, but their sustainability technology and their aesthetic technology, if right. you will, um, to, to the whole mixture. I really appreciated that. Let me, let me say also that uh, the Germans, in this case, uh, the second year, uh, reach out to us. They want to be here. You, you right. helped organize this program, I know. They want to be here. They want to come and, um, and, and touch us and be part of the Hawaii scene. But nobody else from Europe is doing that. It's just right. the German. In fact, even the Chinese aren't really doing that when they come here and try to have a conference like this and build relationships. So I'm very impressed with those guys. I think they're doing great work. And I think we cannot, we Hawaii cannot be insular. We have to look across the oceans. We, we have to find out what's going on everywhere in the world, as you do. You reach mm -hmm. out. Um, we, we need to be connected because we need the benefit of their innovations, their, their creative thinking. And when you have a conference like the one earlier this week, we get the benefit of their creative thinking. Yeah, you're exactly right on that, Mark, because like, I live in a house that I grew up in, and when my wife asked me to remodel it, I go, I can't, I can only see it this way. We here in Hawaii tend to look at our, our energy systems and things like we can only see it the way it is. And when you bring somebody from the outside that has a different way of doing things to begin with or different innovative and new technologies, they can bring us ideas that we just can't conceive of because we're used to doing it one way. And they're not incompatible. Their, their concepts are sustainable, just like ancient Hawaiian uh, culture was sustainable with fishing and agriculture. So they kind of bring in a complementary um, look. And you're right, they want to be here. They want to be part of the community. They want to do the best they can do to help um, Hawaii be Hawaii. Yeah. I'm so glad you, you set that up. So, Stan, you spoke at this. Uh, David Lasner, president of UH, spoke. A number of people from Germany and from, you know, UH and, and the community, the energy community here spoke. But you spoke. Can you tell us what you talked about? Yeah, I, I was on a panel with um, Paul Pontio from Blue Planet Research, uh, Mitch Ewan um, from University, HNEI. Um, we had um, one of the gentlemen that was from, actually worked with, Dr. Kroc from uh, University of Hawaii on the OTEC. Oh, Hans Kroc, Hans engineer. Kroc, yeah, yeah, a long time ago. Went to Germany, went back to school, got his PhD and everything, and then came back to talk, but he was totally immersed in hydrogen world. A young lady, a uh, Chinese young lady from, uh, from one of the companies was also on the panel. I'm trying to think who else was on the panel. And it was uh, moderated by Rick Rochelow from HNEI. Yeah, great. Um, but my talk was focused on um, doing everything in the hydrogen world. Everything from residential, for people that can afford a residential system where they could use their photovoltaics on the roof and maybe a small electrolyzer to, to make hydrogen and store it for long-term energy storage and some batteries in their house to kind of do the power smoothing and the, and the power surge mm -hmm. controls. And then they would have a car that runs on hydrogen, Toyota or Hyundai or Honda, they're all in production now, Take one of those cars and never have to buy fuel for the car or electricity for the house, but set up their system so it could do everything. So that could be at one end of the scale. And the other end of the scale could be Hawaii doing liquid hydrogen off of geothermal on the Big Island and exporting that power to the world, including Oahu. But exporting, can you imagine the economic impact of Hawaii going from an energy importing economy to an energy exporting economy. We gotta do that. And the market is already there. The mainland wants liquid hydrogen, the military wants liquid hydrogen, Asia wants liquid hydrogen. If we can step out and do that, and it doesn't have to be funded by the, the state, 
The state can do public-private partnerships with large companies like Air Liquide, Air Gas, that do those systems, and big companies that do modern geothermal. Not that Pune Geothermal is ancient, but it is fairly old technology, and there's much cleaner, safer, new technology that can take the electricity from geothermal and some heat and turn it into liquid hydrogen and then have that for an export. HECO also needs a really good baseload renewable source on Oahu to make their goal of 2045, and liquid hydrogen would be a great one. So we have both ends of the scale there. The individuals with solar on their house can use any curtailed power or power they're not using to make hydrogen and use it in their car and on their house and to be their backup reserve power for their, their own home. Then you have the large scale and everything in between. Mitch, you and pitched, and I agree with them that if the public's gonna put money into this, like the government, then you ought to be doing buses and, and transportation that's public transportation. And so he and the young Chinese girl from one of the companies were pitching to do fleets. Um, I also said that in the middle there, there's forklifts. Toyota makes forklifts, several, uh, there's at least four or five companies that make material handling equipment um, that's perfect for warehouses that are enclosed, like refrigerated warehouses, where you can't have carbon monoxide you know, being emitted. And instead of just using battery power, which in cold climates it deteriorates the battery a little yeah. bit, but also if you, if you run 24 hours a day, a hydrogen forklift, you just go over and squirt some hydrogen in and it's back on the, on the floor doing work instead of having to stop and recharge it for hours. So we just talked about the full spectrum of infrastructure and equipment and vehicles that we can use. And we didn't even get into ships and boats and aircraft on hydrogen. So you were on the, <clears throat> the panel that uh, Rick Rochelow moderated, uh, and that was about batteries as an asset on, on development of grid. So uh, w what I get out of that is that hydrogen and batteries, they're all assets on developing grid. It, exactly. In fact, I started off my talk saying, I like batteries, because most people think hydrogen people don't like batteries. But I pointed out that you have dry cell batteries, like alkaline batteries and nickel cadmium batteries. And then you have wet cell batteries, like your 12 volt in your car. You have lithium iron phosphate batteries, like the ones that Blue Planet sells. And then you have fuel cell batteries, which have an anode, a cathode, just like any other battery, except you push hydrogen and air in, and it makes electricity from hydrogen and air. It's a self-charging battery. So wow. in, include it, include fuel cells in your battery category. And we need the traditional batteries to go with the fuel cells to complement the way you structure your power. And Paul Pontio pointed that out in his talk. But I point that out because if you just strictly think batteries the way we're, HECO's doing now, or a lot of people are doing, even the Air Force is doing now, much to my chagrin, they forget that Batteries, just because you're used to them, aren't the solution, aren't the total solution. Because by weight, they're too heavy. If you wanted to ship energy from the Big Island Geothermal to Oahu with batteries, your barge wouldn't be floating very well. I mean, the, the batteries would be so huge and take up so much, be so heavy, you couldn't move them. They're also expensive. They're also inefficient when you use them in mass because most batteries don't, you want to cycle them, but if you're using them just to cover peak loads and stuff and store energy for a long time, they're not very efficient. So the idea is to use the full range of technologies in the battery world to com complement each other and take the hydrogen and make it your long-term storage or your high power storage and use the full spectrum. And the key to export is with the hydrogen because you can export it anywhere in the world. You exactly. don't have any deterioration uh, and it can be used anywhere in the world. It's, uh, it's fungible. Exactly. So let me ask you this. Uh, I'm sure after your talk, you spoke to some Germans there. And I'm really wondering what their reaction is and whether the Germans are interested in what you're talking about, hydrogen, you know, mm -hmm. balanced with batteries, uh, and whether they're doing work in the same area. Yeah, actually, I, I talked to some of them before the, the conference, and the one German gentleman on our panel, he gave my briefing. I, I, in fact, I didn't even use... I used one slide from one of the companies that came there, but his talk covered everything that I was gonna talk about, That's Derek. So we're gonna take a quick break here, and we'll be back with uh, concerned citizen Jay that I found homeless downstairs in a few minutes. And aloha, my name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform, 
And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at three, and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. Hey, welcome back to Stand Energy Man. On my lunch hour, as usual, for Community Matters. And we're here with Jay Fidel talking about uh, what happened earlier this week at the German Hawaii Energy Symposium up at the University of Hawaii. And we we're talking about um, some of the interfaces that we had. So there was one young gentleman I told you worked, <clears throat> was a student of Hans Kroc, who was the inventor basically of OTEC, or ocean thermal power. Um, and he moved back to Germany, did a lot of work, and then came back. And he was for, uh, on our panel, um, along with Aaron Kirk from Hawaii Gas. And his briefing was just, it covered everything that I would have put in my That's briefing. Great. And That's great. so it's like they're on the same wavelength that I am over here. And it's probably like you say, I, I try and, and cover and look at what everybody else is doing because I, I look at what can work here and I find so much that can work here. And, and we're really excited about trying to make some of that happen. So it was a great event. Uh, the uh, German Consul General, uh, Dennis Sala, he did a great job uh, with his team. And I'm looking forward to next year. It's gonna be really exciting. Great success. And we, we got uh, one panel there, the one uh, on sustainable buildings, architects, uh, the architects sustainability panel chaired by Martin Despang, mm -hmm. who is one of our yeah. hosts here at Think Tech and who hosts a show on Tuesdays for a long time called uh, Humane Architecture. Mm -hmm. And then a smaller panel with the uh, Maximilian sites that you mm -hmm. mentioned about those container homes. Mm -hmm. um, and that was very interesting and we got some great pictures of them. So yeah. bottom line is uh, there was a lot to offer in that program. It was a one-day program, but it was shock a block. It was, it was jam-packed. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of stuff in there. Yeah. Well, but that's not the only stuff that happened last week. So we're going to throw up one of the other pictures that, uh, that, we, that we took this week, and I'll talk a little bit about it. This is actually, we call it SPOD, and you notice it's got some Air Force stuff on the side. It's actually just a real simple, like a FedEx-type van. But that van, as plain as it looks, is a hydrogen fuel cell van with a 30 kilowatt fuel cell and 100 kilowatt hours of battery power in it. And it can export power. It can export pretty much any kind of power you want. So what we did was we told the manufacturer when he, when he built the van that it had to cover from 110 to 440 volt AC and we had to cover one phase and three phase, and it had to cover DC from 12 volt to 48 volt. So he built this system to basically do whatever the Air Force needed it to do on a flight line, because that's the kind of vehicle they use on the flight line to take mechanics and the equipment out to the airplanes and fix the airplanes. So they, they delivered that van several months ago, and the Air Force was out here this week, and we had the company configure it to do basically its thing. And it blew, it blew everybody away because it did more stuff than I even thought it would do. <laughs> Not only would it export the power um, in AC and DC, but it could import solar power from the solar to charge its own battery. So you could sit there in the back with a little laptop computer and go, take the power from the battery, turn it into three-phase 240 volt, and send it out through these two outlets here. Or you could say, no, we don't want three-phase 240, we want... 110 volt and send it 20 amp circuits this way. Uh, or no, we're gonna charge this other uh, fuel, this other electric vehicle, so we want single phase DC going there. And you could you could just literally at the computer set it up and do it. So, so this does suggest some really interesting possibilities. Oh yeah. Uh, one possibility uh, to that last point you made is, um, so I'm, I'm down and out, I have an electric car, 
Um, I, I don't have any power left. I'm empty. You know, the, the, the old um, road, road concern becomes real. Yep. <laughs> uh, range concern becomes real. So I, I call uh, a vehicle like this, and the vehicle comes to me and charges me up. Sure. Uh, and it can do a number of charges like that, and it's uh, totally mobile. Um, and, and I, as an investor, uh, an entrepreneur, I can buy a vehicle like this and, and make some money charging people up when they run out of electric power. Or so. charging portable power stations. You know, a lot of times when you have to put power into a building to do charging stations for EVs, but if you had standalone systems that maybe had a, a hydrogen, solar, and batteries, in, but it was getting really used a lot, you need to kind of boost it up take one of these vehicles, plug it in, boost the batteries up, get it caught up on its power, and let it keep charging vehicles. So that, and you don't have to be attached to the grid. But this vehicle has a lot of, a lot of other good uses the military's looking at, and we actually demonstrated a couple weeks ago with the National Guard. During emergencies, this vehicle can go over to a building and plug into a building and run a building, a small building for like maybe a day. Um, and the size of a, a, bigger than a house, but smaller than a condominium, <clears throat> and provide the power that you need for a command post or emergency response place um, for a day, or a gas station, or a water treatment plant, or a, a residence. You know, and you can do the same thing in those commercial buses that we're talking about with, with Mitch Ewan, that those vehicles can then be used by the city or the county to be portable rolling power supplies to go plug in and give power at a hospital or whatever if you need it. So that technology is important, and, and we demonstrated with one of our five kilowatt fuel cells about two weeks ago. We work with the Hawaii National Guard and, and their surf p which is a, a chemical response team, and the Indonesian military uh, in an event out of Kalailoa, where we provided power for those tents to, to operate their, their equipment. And they were blown away with the hydrogen. It was actually more reliable and smoother power than the diesel generator. And lighter so, weight, because you can oh, put yeah. more of it on a vehicle. Exactly. That's one of the things I, I push to the Air Force, that if they are going to go with a lot of batteries, they're going to be increasing the weight of what they ship. And if you use hydrogen, you're decreasing the weight, and you don't have to ship fuel because the fuel you get from the local solar panels or whatever you have downrange. So a lot lighter shipping and better mileage. God, it boggles the mind how many possibilities when you have a, a, a effectively an electrical charging a device that right. can move around exactly um, and and give you large charges for large buildings and incredible medium sized buildings incredible flexibility yeah yeah now the next images we have coming up these are kind of fun because if you any of you that know David Rolf he's the head of the Y Auto Dealers Association when he talks about about vehicles or he talks about America in general he says Americans only understand two things cars and pizza. So the next thing coming up on the screen, I was blown away this week when a friend of mine sent me pictures of a Toyota Tundra with a hydrogen fuel cell drivetrain, and in the back end of it is a Pizza Hut, actually a Pizza Hut oven and everything. And they have, they've shown this at several auto shows, but it's hydrogen fuel cell. And so I sent it to Dave Rolf and said, now you gotta change what you talk about, because obviously Toyota Tacomas and Toyota Tundras are sold more here than anywhere, any other vehicle on the planet. So now you gotta change it to people only know, to pickup trucks and pizza. And here's why, we're gonna do it with hydrogen. So that one's for Dave Rolf, and uh, I really loved seeing that one. So how do they, uh, this is, does the, the truck heat the pizza? Oh, it cooks some it. some kind of special arrangement it, it there? It makes it, it cooks it, and it cuts it up. It does everything, it's all automated. It's pretty impressive. Automated pizza. Yeah, so electric pizza, if you will. On demand. Hydrogen electric on, pizza. On demand. So what about the Mirai? How's the Mirai doing? Um, I just actually got a call from Surfco this morning, and they're getting ready to actually get the leases finalized for folks, and they wanted to know if I was still on the list. And um, I had to tell them that I just bought a Subaru from Servco, so <laughs> I, I may not be personally on the list, but I'm, I'm still considering it. Um, but for sure, our office would like to probably set up a lease and have it available to do more demonstration things within the state government and within the community. And Because right now we have two light carts um, we have two generators, we have a small electric vehicle, and if we had the Mirai, when we do events to support the community, we would take all those out to demonstrate them to support um, hydrogen. How does that lease work? Are there special benefits attached? 
They, uh, it's a three-year lease. They didn't give me numbers on it, but um, it's a three-year lease, and they provide hydrogen for the for the three years, up to fifteen thousand dollars worth of hydrogen. Wow! They so, provide the fuel. Wow! Yeah. So when you look at the cost of the vehicle, and everybody goes, "Oh, that's kind of high," but when you're getting fifteen thousand dollars worth of fuel with the vehicle, that drops. The price down to, I think, a really reasonable price. So. Is that enough to, uh, do we know whether that's enough to carry the vehicle for the oh, three yeah. years? It, depending on your personal driving habits. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is the folks at Toyota have been driving those vehicles because their station's been up and running for several months. But the, the, um, the leadership and some of the folks have been driving the vehicles and they're reporting about 10% more mileage, better mileage than they expected out of the vehicles. So they're expecting just over 300 miles per fill-up, and they're getting more like 340, 350, and even a little higher. So, you know, depending on how much driving you do and your driving habits and whether you live up, you know, have to drive uphill and downhill all the time, it'll, it'll vary for your vehicle. Well, but Depending on the lease price, that could yeah. be very attractive. Yeah. yeah. What I'd like to do to wrap up the show today is show one last video, again, because I'm a kind of a hydrogen junkie, and Jay knows this, so he's going to go with it. But uh, we produced a really good video that I'd like to show um, that, that talks about hydrogen, how it works, so folks can understand hydrogen. So, Robert, if we can roll that video, I'd appreciate it. Hydrogen, the simplest element and also the most abundant. Hydrogen makes up roughly 75% of all mass in the universe. Hydrogen also powers most of the stars in our universe. So it's only fitting that it has come to be recognized as a viable alternative energy source. And we need alternatives because fossil fuels are problematic. They're messy, dirty, expensive to obtain and not secure. And they're limited. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is everywhere. Hydrogen can be produced from a wide variety of sources, including water itself, using other renewable energies. That means it's clean, really clean. As a zero emission fuel source, the only byproducts are water, heat, and electricity. Easily transported, hydrogen can be stored and distributed on a large scale as either gas or liquid. As a fuel, hydrogen itself is very light. In fact, hydrogen is 472 times more efficient by weight than lead acid batteries. And it isn't just for transportation. Hydrogen can also effectively produce and store energy for power grids. Hydrogen gas is transformed into energy within a fuel cell. As hydrogen passes through a fuel cell, electrons are released and an electrical current is produced and captured for use. Electric vehicle motors powered by hydrogen fuel cells are twice as efficient as gas or diesel engines. They can travel farther distances than lithium batteries, especially in heavy vehicles, and can last for decades. Hydrogen-powered fuel cells are scalable to buses and commercial fleets such as trucks, trains, ships, and aircraft. Fuel cells allow for fast, easy refueling, and hydrogen can be easily adapted to current refueling stations, making it a convenient fuel source for everyone. It is a proven, safe, clean, and efficient energy source currently in use worldwide. Hydrogen is everywhere including our clean energy future. And that's going to wrap it up for Stan the Energy Man this first week in November of 2018. And I'd like to thank Jay Fidel for filling into my, uh, my vacant seat here. Thank you so much, Jay. <laughs> thank you, Stan. It's been great. Always good having you on because I got my start here with you on Monday afternoons <laughs> or Wednesday afternoons. But we'll see you next week on Stan the Energy Man. Aloha.